Okay, grounding and bonding. I always like doing these presentations because they're so educational for me and I learn a lot when I do these things. And it also makes me go back and double check and sometimes triple check that what I'm saying is correct. As in my SWR article, that's got to be one of the most well-researched articles I've ever written because I wanted to be really careful that everything I said I could back up. And this station grounding uh, was kind of the same thing. Um, so pretty much everything I'm going to tell you here, if you follow these guidelines, you will have a station that's grounded as per the National Electric Code. Uh, I think the number on that is 820. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But um, one other point. You're going to see some pictures throughout this presentation. Most of them are mine. This is a picture I took up in Canada on like October the 5th that it snowed the days before and we just happened to be driving past and I thought this was such a great picture. Um, so anyhow, but to carry on, station and tower grounding. So grounding and bonding, what is it? Why is grounding and bonding necessary? Some practical examples. I got a couple of pictures of a couple of people's stations. Um, RF grounding, where does the RF come from and how to minimize and control stray RF. Now you will see some common themes in, throughout this presentation because I'm also one of these people that talk about common mode current a lot. If you read any of the articles I've wrote, that's one of the things I consistently bring up is common mode current. You will see it again in this presentation. Why is grounding and bonding so important? AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management. Now, I'm not going to go into AC safety very much in this presentation. Um, main reason for that is most of that is already baked into most people's houses. Because uh, when your house is built, there's a, uh, usually a code that the city uh, or the contractor has to abide by. And, and then you've got the, uh, the uh, electrical code. Um, and the inspectors come and I, yeah, if you've ever changed your electrical system on your house and had Rocky Mountain Power come out and check everything, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, sometimes it's a little painful because I found that Rocky Mountain Power can't always make up their mind about certain things. So it's always fun. The other reason I'm not going to talk a lot about AC safety is because there's a lot of overlap between AC safety and lightning uh, protection. They, there's a big overlap there. One depends on the other pretty much. So we'll, we'll kind, of, kind of skip over that. And then the last one is RF management, which is a huge problem. Some people don't even know they have. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that more. What is grounding and bonding? Grounding very simply means to connect to the earth. Uh, in some cultures, instead of saying grounding, they'll say earthing. And there's a reason for that is because grounding in terms of uh, electricity can have two meanings. So if you're into building uh, electrical devices and components, there's the grounding that goes on inside the chassis or on a circuit board where you'll gra you, you've got a ground circuit and everything connects to that inside the, on the PC board. And then there's the grounding that we're going to talk about, which is called earthing. And so whenever you hear me, the, hear me use the term grounding this morning, I'm talking about earthing, okay, which is basically connecting to the earth. And then there's bonding, which simply means connecting together, kind of like when you get married. You're bonded to each other. So, and, uh, and then one last point, there's a little note here. I didn't know where to put this note because um, I didn't know where to fit it. And in talking to, in talking to uh, Mike about it, I decided, we decided this was probably a good place to put it. Never use solder as the only means of bonding ground wires. High voltage strike, like from lightning, 
will melt that solder in an eye blink or faster. So always use some sort of a mechanical device like a clamp, like one of these, uh, or like a crimp on. So all of my wires that run from my equipment to my grounding bus, those are all crimped and soldered. So everything outside though I use these kind of these kind of big clamps. So I won't say any more about that. Just if you try to solder two wires together and call that your grounding, that's probably not going to be a good solution. A typical station, uh, a typical station here, uh, here's your service panel, your ground rods, grounded uh, ground rods. You've got what I call the station bus station grounding bus and then you've got all your equipment connected to this station grounding bus and this station grounding bus actually does two things it it bonds all of your equipment together and it connects your equipment to the outside ground now this is this is the proper way it should be done um, you should never daisy chain. So in other words, you don't run a wire from here to here to here and then to here. Um, let's go back. Okay. Um, and then uh, here's kind of a fine point. You'll notice here on the computer, the computer's got a ground that goes to your utility ground right here. But the computer's also got a ground that runs to the, the common bus. This, one of the advantages of this strategy is that if, it, if your equipment is healthy, but you've got that, have you ever heard someone have a buzz on their, their signal? Okay, that's usually, usually, not always, usually caused by what they call a ground loop. This type of a configuration will pre prevent that ground loop. So, you should, this is how you should wire your station together. Everything's connected to a common bus, and then that bus is connected to your outside um, grounding. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so you say that this is the, like, the optimal setup. Um, it, so the idea is, as long as you have a grounding loop, it should eliminate the chance for that buzz and noise. If you hear that, you probably don't have a correct grounding that would be true, but it's also possible that you've got a piece of faulty equipment. Okay. This is especially the case with some of uh, some power supplies. They'll have that hum in them no matter what. But if you follow this approach, that should minimize grounding loop. Okay, another question over here. Yeah, is ground the chassis of the computer case? Is that yes. That's that's what this is inferring. So the computer. And I, and I did a double take on this. This is how I set my station up years ago. But I did a double take on this because I wanted to ensure that I was doing this right. And from everything that I was able to read, and I will, again, strongly recommend this book. This was, I bought this at the swap meet this, this, uh, this year. And uh, yeah, it, and a lot of what's here came from this book so but yes so my computer one of the screws that holds the case on goes to this common grounding bus and then the power cord goes into a um, um, surge suppressor and then into the wall outlet at my house go ahead Larry I think a lot of us use a laptop is there anything we need to do with that great question uh, that is covered in the book. Great question. A lot of us use a laptop. Here's the thinking behind laptops. If your laptop is connected to your station, in other words, there's a physical connection between your laptop and say your radio, like through the cat cable, then yes, you should ground your laptop to the common station ground. But if your laptop's just kind of sitting over on the corner and the only thing you use it for is 
maybe filling out your log and it's not connected to anything other than the utility power, then no, you do not. Did I answer your question, Larry? You did. How do you ground on that? <laughs> Which way? Another good question. <laughs> Usually on most laptops today, there is a locking nut that you can lock the laptop, lock. you can physically lock the computer so it won't walk away. It's called the Kensington lock. The what? It's called the Kensington lock. Okay, the Kensington lock. It slides in and locks in place and you can ground to that. that. That will serve as your grounding screw. Another option is usually on the back of your laptop, there's going to be like a HDMI port or a serial port or a parallel port. And there's usually two small uh, nuts that you can screw in to secure those cables. You could use one of those as well. Put an alligator clip on it, clip it to your grounding bar. Alan, go ahead. What do you recommend the brush be made of? Another good question, and I actually cover that in the next slide. Let's, uh, oh, we'll get to that in a minute. So I'll answer your question now. I made mine out of a piece of aluminum angle that I got down at Home Depot, at, or Lowell's, we don't remember which, I support them both. Uh, and that's all it is, it's just a piece of thin half inch uh, aluminum angle and then I drilled a bunch of holes in it and made up a bunch of short uh, wires that connect between my equipment and that grounding bus. Now you could use a copper pipe, uh, you could use a piece of cable running along the back of your desk. Um, I mean there's just a ton of different ways to do it. The one thing that someone might caution you on is using dissimilar metals. I don't worry about that inside the shack. So like going from a copper wire to that aluminum bus bar, you don't need to worry about galvanic action because it's really not exposed to any moisture. So it won't be a problem. Outside, different conversation. There was another question. I was just going to say, I used a piece of brass plate. That'd work great, yeah. Anything, any any ferrous metal, any conductive metal is what you want to use. So aluminum, copper, brass, whatever. Uh, and then the other thing I've done is I've I've made up a, a bunch of um, well not a bunch but I have about three uh, of these little jumper cables. It's got alligator clips on both ends. So if I'm going to bring in a piece of gear and just temporarily uh, put it in the station to work on it then I'll clip it into the common bus bar. So that's the other, the other thing I do. Making sure every piece of gear is connected to that bus bar is really important. Yeah, so I get confused between, uh, I'm not sure I got the terms right. One is RF grounding and the other is electrical grounding because there's a difference. Yes. Are you using just a, a common stranded wire to ground your equipment? Or are you using a, 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 a braided type wire for grounding? Do um, you think there's that big a difference between the two? So I'm, I'm processing your question a little bit because it's there's kind of a question in a question. Um, Sorry. So the first part of the question was about using braided wire versus using regular wire. <laughs> The literature really says, you know, use flat rate. And the reason they th say that is because um, RF likes to travel on the outside, and so the more surface area you, you have, the better. So that's an RF ground then. Well, it, but it serves both purposes in the case of, in the DC case, ground. In, in this case, it would serve both purposes. So, um, and, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I've used both, and now I've never been struck by lightning. Would it make a difference if I was struck by lightning? I, I don't know, and I'd love to talk to somebody that has and say, did it make a difference to you? I, I really think, and based on everything that I read, they, they just, they say, use a number 14 or a number 12 gauge wire to connect your internal equipment to that bus bar and then run a heavier piece of 
wire um, to get out to your ground, okay? Now, I will say absolutely I would never use braid outside. Right. Just... And, I, and I wish I would have brought a piece of braid that I, that I got off an antenna that had been outside for like 20 years. It was literally ready to fall apart because that braid just, just it corrodes and deteriorates in the weather. So outside, I would always use like a number six or a number eight wire. I'd never use braid outside. So, because it does break down. Now, if you wanted to use like flat copper strips, great, perfect. But I've even been surprised at the amount of uh, deterioration you'll see with flat copper strips. Um, and I, in, in fact, it's funny, I was redoing some of my grounding and I use what they call plumber's tape, which is a copper strip that's about yay wide. It's got a whole bunch of holes in it. You can get it down at home. Well, you used to be able to get it at Home Depot's and, and Lowell's. Um, and I, when I undid it, I was amazed at the amount of corrosion there was uh, where it connected to the, the ground post coming out of my shack. And you'll see a picture of this in a minute. So um, now RF ground, that part of your question, I'd like to leave until later because I talk specifically about the difference between RF grounding and regular grounding. So we'll come, we'll come back to that. On your picture there, you show a ground wire going from one rod to the other rod underground. Correct. Is that essential? Is that, is that? According to this, according to the NEC code, yes. Your ground rod should be bonded together. Now, I have a problem at my house in that I've got the service ground that the electrician put in. I have no idea where it is. None. No clue. I know where the wire comes from that hooks into my service panel. But where that grounding rod is, I don't have any idea. My grounding rod is the wire going from the service to the water pipe coming in through the foundation. Okay. Now, to run a wire from there to another grounding rod that I have immediately adjacent to the rig, they're going to do that without cutting concrete. It, it may not be practically possible, and I get that. Remember, there's things you can control and things you can't control. It's like, I live right up next to the mountain, working any DX to the east ain't gonna happen. It's okay, that's life, you know? I chose to live there, so that's the way it is. Which leads me to something I, uh, I did wanna talk about briefly. I went and visited a, a soon to be New Ham station uh, the other day, and the fellow had temporarily set up a very small ham station in a front bedroom. Um, and from a practical perspective, getting anything to that space was going to be kind of difficult. And he had another spare room that he wasn't using around over on the other side of his house. And I was thinking, if he would use that other room, it would make it so much more practical for him in terms of running grounds, in terms of running coaxial cable. So the point of what I'm saying is if you have a choice of where to locate your ham station in your house. Now, there's not very many of us that are there. I mean, most of us, we're, you know, we get assigned to the basement or some back bedroom by, what, what is it, Bill, you call your property manager, Bill? Is that what yes. you, yeah. Your pro our property manager tells us where we're going to put stuff. But if you have a choice, think about getting to ground. That's why ham shacks on second floor is a really bad idea. Now, granted, Again, worry about the things that you have control over and do the best you can with the things you don't have control over. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay. This is not my picture. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Next one. See the grill. Okay. There this. You are. This is of what you were saying. Yeah. Th well, this is this is a this is a regular ground rod. I mean, this is this is typical, and this is the right way to do it. Except it's braided cable, and you said don't use. No, it no, it's outside. no, no, it's twisted cable. It's stranded. It's not braided. It's stranded. It's not braided. It's stranded. Ah. Okay. Okay. It's strand. It's stranded. You have a chunk of this kind of wire. It's exactly what you're showing there. Exactly. So this is just a really common, this is how we all do it. Okay. Here's uh, a picture over, I think this is from Jay's house, if I'm not mistaken. Now, one of the things, I, and Jay, I, I'm not being critical of you. I think you did this right, okay? So know that. What would be interesting though, is I would love to take an ohm meter and get a reading here and here and see how much resistance, if any. There might not be any, but then again, what may have happened due to the corrosion that's going on there, and you can see from the patina, you know, that ground rod has been in place for quite a long time. This picture made me go do something. So I went outside and I pulled a ground lug off of one of my ground rods because I wanted to see how much corrosion had built up between the copper ground pipe and the wire that this secured. And I'm going to pass this around. When you look at it, you'll notice that the copper on the screw is pretty clean. So I had a really good connection with the ground rod. But if you look over here where the ground wire was actually at, there's some corrosion there. So I think my takeaway from this, but again, I'd love to measure the resistance going on between that clamp and that wire, just to, just to see if it makes a difference. Because if it does, what I'm gonna suggest is periodically you refresh these and put some antiox on them. Loosen them up, take them apart, clean them up, put some antiox on them, and screw them back together and leave them set for two years, you know, and then come back and see what it looks like. Just didn't read anything about that in a book, but when I looked at that and I thought, I wonder what that might look like. But anyhow, this is your typical, this is the way we do it. So this is how Jay did it. Perfect example. I'm assuming there's only one ground rod because there's no bonding strap going over to another ground rod. And that's fine. You don't have to put in 47 ground rods. It's okay. Especially if you don't have an 80 foot tower. Now if you got an 80 foot tower, that might be a different conversation. Okay, here is another example. This one is from Todd's house. And we'll see more uh, of what Todd did in just a minute. And this is my house. The key thing on this one to take away is the notice that it's hard to see in this picture, but I've got a really heavy, this is an old um, jumper cable, and it connects over here to the base of my tower and runs over here to a ground rod. And then I have two other ground rods and everything is bonded together. But because I can't find the service ground, uh, I, didn't, I can't bond to it because I don't know where it is. But everything does go back to my service panel, which I'll show you a picture of. Why, what should you use for grounding and bonding? Okay, this is where, um, really simple, uh, number 14 or number 12 wire inside your shack is, is good enough, okay? Uh, outside your shack, you want to use either number 8. Uh, well, the, the book says, uh, and, and the code says, you should use uh, number 6. So I'm going to pass around a number six. So this is, and you get this at Home Depot. This is what the electrician used when he put in my ground, was this number six wire. This other wire is a piece of number eight. So I'll go ahead and pass these around. Get those at Home Depot. I think that number six wire, I think that runs about a buck seventy a foot. So a little expensive, but that's, and, a, and I just picked this up just the other day because I'm going to replace a couple of 
of my ground wires. Insulated or not? Uh, great question. I tend to like to use insulated wire because it won't break down in weather. Over time, copper will break down. It will, it will deteriorate over time. Although they have found copper artifacts that are thousands of years old, but I've also seen copper that's been buried in the ground that comes out and just literally falls apart. So I like to use insulated. Now, for bonding, uh, I've seen it done both ways where they use an insulated wire between the, the ground rods, but I've also seen it done where they just use bare copper. So I think either way is fine, but the key takeaway is bond them together. That's really the important message is bond those ground rods together. Um, for lightning protection outside the shack, use one or more eight foot or longer ground rods. They do sell a 10 footer. Um, driven all the way into the ground. I drive mine in. I've only got maybe four to six inches sticking up out of the ground after I'm done. Um, and then I um, make a note here that you should never use braid. Now you've seen, and just to be clear on braid, it's the stuff you can get from DX Engineering. You can buy in different widths. Uh, one of the recommendations that I read in two different books that I read, do not use the braid out of an old piece of coax. Uh, reason for that, they say, is that the, the, when you remove the jacket off those, that braid, that it's, it's, it's not consistent and it uh, just does not make as good a conductor as just using a regular piece of wire wood. So can't verify it, can't confirm it. I'm just saying that's what I read. So all right. Any questions? Go ahead. So Gene, uh, I know there's a little bit of difference. So you're, you're doing uh, permanent station grounding and bonding. And I know uh, in the mobile app, ACLA, application that uh, I guess braid is what you would use underneath to braid, you know, the ground and bond to your exhaust system, to the frame, so that you're, I mean, is that still correct? When it comes I, I wouldn't use braid. Anything outside, I would not use braid. I've seen how it breaks down. I would not use braid. That's why you don't see any braid on a, on a sailboat or any kind of boat. They don't, they don't use braid because it just, it breaks down. I would use a insulated wire, like a piece of that number six or number eight to, if I needed to ground in my truck, say like from my fender to my, my chassis. Now, a note on that, if you're using a wire to get from your antenna to ground, know that that wire is part of your antenna system. So what I tell people is on your mobile antenna, you want to ground it as close to the antenna as you possibly can get it, ideally through the bracket. But say like you've got a fiberglass shell and you want to run a wire from, your, from that antenna to your frame, know that that wire is a part of your antenna and it will radiate and it will pick up RF and sometimes it'll pick up RF that you don't want it to pick up so just be aware of that did I answer your question yes sir so the, the other the other thing about mobile installations is that when you are dealing with different metals uh, and just because the door might Seem like it's uh, grounded out. You want you want the the RF to flow on the surface and be continuous, just like you were talking about. And wherever there's a break, there's going to cause some kind of resistance. And so you, you want to uh, have it to where when you're transmitting that that RF energy is is taking the path of leaf resistance instead of instead of like doing a corn maze trying to find. Remember that. What you're doing on a mobile installation when you're grounding is you're connecting a counterpoise. Right. So for like your two meter and UHF, VHF, the hood of your car is good enough. It's, it's plenty good counterpoise. For HF, if you've got an HF antenna, then you may need to use the whole truck. And so, yeah, and I, I 
kind of always just assumed that everything is electrically grounded together on a truck. When I've checked, like on my truck, I find that it is. So the bed of my truck is electrically connected to the frame of my truck. And my bracket that supports my antenna is electrically connected to the bed of my truck. So I just, you know, but I, but I did check it. I put an ohm meter on it and checked it. So another question, Bill? And that's the place that I've had to, to uh, work, work over occasionally uh, on the body, uh, especially on a truck. Yeah. Big truck in the old days and pickup now. Um, that sometimes you've got paint. Yep. Or you've got some kind of corrosion or something. Yep. And the way the clamp works and everything, you don't really dig into the metal. Yep. So you're talking about checking with the ohmmeter really isn't it's such a step. It it is, and I and I have a Dremel that I use for kind of grinding that paint away when I installed my bracket. Yeah, so I make sure, and I do go back and check it. I'm gonna go ahead and move on if that's okay. Here we go. At a min at a minimum, use grounding clamps. Avoid using stainless steel hose clamps. Now I have used stainless steel hose clamps, especially when I had to clamp around something big. That's okay, but what I do is I'll take a hammer and I'll smash that one end up so that I get maximum surface area connected to whatever I want to connect to. So by smashing into that cable a bit, um, I increase the surface area and then I also put a little dab of antiox on both sides to ensure that I've got a good long-lasting connection to that mass that I'm connecting to. So, um, so you can use stainless steel, but the only reason I don't like to use stainless steel is you don't have as much surface area making contact with the metal uh, that you're, like I said, like, like one of those telescoping masses as an example. Uh, and then over here, they talk about exothermic welding. Now, I've never done this. Uh, I know there's a couple of people, at least one person in the audience that I know has. What? Exothermic welding. It's it's a it's the what the railroad uses for bonding railroad tracks together. Believe it or not. Thermite. Thermite. So what they do is they make a mold that they in the case of the railroad that fits perfectly their railroad track and then they pour some stuff in there with some thermite and they set it on fire and it gets so hot it just goes and it wells it all together and they do make uh, welding kits just for grounding so um, and here's an example of one that you can buy for grounding your ground wire to your ground rod now, if I lived in a high lightning strike zone, I, I would probably give serious thought to this. If I had a 60-foot tower, I'd probably give some serious thought to this. Um, for my installation, I think this may be overkill. I, I think it might be overkill. Of course, the only way I'll ever find out is if I get struck by lightning. And at that point, I might be really sorry I didn't do this. But, um, but it's, just, it's for that ham that wants to go to that extra level of making sure. And then the other thing about uh, this, this welding is if you've got something that's going to be completely underground, like your ground wire goes to your ground rod and it's completely buried, then you would want to consider this. Because over time, that clamp will corrode. But this welding approach will never corrode. The, the, this two pieces of metal bonded permanently together. There will never be any corrosion in that. But like I say, I, this I think is for the ham that's got the big tower with the big station and probably lives out uh, in the flat out in Pleasant View or Hooper or someplace like that where they're a little more prone to getting lightning than maybe somewhere else. He's got $40,000 worth of gear in his shack. Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know. Maybe he's got his granddad's radio that he wants to make sure never gets hurt. Go ahead. 
What's the, diff the distance between the two grounding rods that needs to take? At least a ground rod length apart. Okay. Great question. Yeah, at least a ground rod length apart. Yeah. That exothermic welding is not for kids to play with. That no. Blow yes. If it's damp, even if you're bold, it's just a lot of humidity in it. That will go kaboom. Yes. Be very careful. Yes. In fact, I would say if you were going to do this, probably talk to somebody that's actually done it before you take it on. So, what's that? You could probably do that too, but then you've got to pound the ground rod in, and will that knock that weld? I, I don't know, but that absolutely, and I saw pictures where that's exactly what they had done, is just using conventional welding, welded the ground rod to a piece of wire. So that's doable too. So, so I'll call uh, next time I do it. I'll call Scott and say, Scott, bring your welder over here. Let's weld some. Let's weld some uh, ground rods together. Uh, outside, never use aluminum wire to connect directly to a copper rod. Why? Galvanic action will absolutely destroy that connection over time. Um, trust me, I have first-hand experience with this, having sailed out on the Great Salt Lake for 15 years. Galvanic action is amazing stuff, and I've seen it do in a week what should take months, if not years. This was especially so when I made a sailboat crossing from the U.S. to uh, uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, I was amazed at what salt water can do. Fortunately, around here, the only people that are troubled by that are people out on the Great Salt Lake. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, how many ground rods? Well, here again, I think at a minimum one, at a minimum one. But if you have a tower, I think maybe two or three. You know, it's something you need to think about. What the ARL says, and then here it says place ground rods six to eight feet apart. Uh, ARL recommends three ground rods. This is what they have in that book. So this I think is fairly extreme. They're not only using nine ground rods, they're using some radial wires here as well. So now, if I had a 80 foot tower and I lived in Oklahoma, I'd probably give serious thought to this. Um, I only have a 40 foot tower. I've got two ground rods connected directly to my tower, but overall there, it's connected to three ground rods in total. And I live up next to the mountain and I'm, we're not too prone to get a lot of late lean. But I did take the time to, to do this. And they show this circle of protection here where uh, a set of those ground rods are, everything is bonded together as you can see, but they've got one where there's a circle of grounding that goes completely around the tower. So this is, I'd say this is a really solid approach, but it's probably more trouble than what a lot of people want to go to. But you do this, you're going to be in good shape. Additional lightning protection for antennas. All coax should be grounded before entering the shack. There are two ways of accomplishing this. Using a grounding block. This is a picture of a product you can get from um, DX Engineering. I, uh, I just made my own out of, again, that aluminum uh, angle and with a, with a, uh, a U-clamp, a stainless steel U-clamp. And I clamp it right onto the ground rod, and then I've drilled some holes and put uh, some bulkhead connectors in there. And then and the downside of doing that is it doesn't it doesn't take care of the center conductor. So anything coming down that center conductor is not gonna find its way to ground, like static electricity is just one example. And a lightning stroke is another example. So the better way to do it is with lightning arresters. So um, here's one from uh, Polyphaser. This, when I went up to Mount Ogden, Polyphaser seemed to be the lightning arrester of choice on Mount Ogden. And I figured the guys that built that knew what they were doing. 
So, and these run 70, 80 bucks, so they're not cheap. Um, I think these are kind of the kind that uh, if, I think Todd is using. I don't know what brand they are. Then you've got the MFJs. These are pretty inexpensive, the MFJs. And then you've got some other ones. This is gold one over here. I've got to believe it's going to cost, I don't know, 200 bucks. But, and then over here in the corner, right here, is a lightning arrestor for your rotator cable. So yes, your rotator cable should be grounded as well. Lightning, that surge will need a place to go and it'll come right down that coax, that uh, rotator cable and right into your ham shack. So you should put, or at the very minimum, go out and disconnect your rotator cable if you got lightning coming in, at the very minimum. So anyhow, so that's what you should be using. So here's a picture of Todd's station. I really like the way Todd did this. You'll notice every piece of coax has got a lightning arrestor on it and every lightning arrestor runs to ground. I think Todd did a great job. He put it in this gray box. Uh, these two co cables here uh, go through under his backyard. One goes to his vertical and so his coax is protected, comes into this box, hits the uh, lightning arrestor there. So even static electricity is bled off of his uh, coaxial cables. So this is a first-rate installation. And I also like that he used, and I saw uh, Alan did this at his station, uh, used steel wool around the bottom to insulate the, to keep the rodents out. Question? Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, grounding the uh, rotator. Yes. The antenna. Where do you ground to that? Do you ground to the shell of it, or do you ground something inside it? Or? On the rotator, you're going to have a ground wire. The, the at least the rotator I have carries 12 volt uh, DC, and so the the one of those terminals is considered to be ground. So I'm not so much worried about connecting to the shell, and I actually pulled my rotator apart um, when I was rebuilding it to see how it was wired. And, and, uh, and the DC, 12 volt DC wire, one of those wires actually did go to the chassis of the rotator. But the big thing is, is you wanna make sure that that rotator cable has got a lightning arrestor on it as well. Now those lightning arrestors, that's considered the sacrificial part of your lightning protection system? Uh, depends on the lightning arrestor. A lot of them will have a gas insert in them and when they get struck by lightning, you will ultimately need to replace the gas insert. Some don't. And they have a way of being able to bleed off uh, static as well as uh, a lightning strike. Um, I did not, I have not gone into the science of what's inside a lightning arrestor, so I can't really go any deeper than that other to tell you that I've seen two different kinds. So. Have you ever checked continuity to a lightning arrestor? At DC, they're going to look like a short. At DC, they'll look like a short. A lot of antennas at DC look like a short. So if you put a voltmeter on, a, on an antenna, a lot of time, or even on a ballot, they look like a short. So, yes. The uh, the cheaper lightning arresters, they're single use. They slag. They burn up completely. I would believe that. That's what protects your system. Is that they they are like fusible length. They just go out. They yeah. I uh, and I believe. Expensive ones. I understand. They do have a replaceable something or other that can be purchased and stuffed on the inside. <laughs> Not a whole lot of us are buying the expensive ones. <laughs> yeah, some of us are, some of us aren't. So here again, you know, do the best you can with what you got, and don't sweat it otherwise. Don't lose sleep over it. That's that's all you can do. Remember, ham radio is a hobby, right? It's supposed to be fun, damn it. So. <laughs> all right. Okay. Here's another installation. I don't know where this is. Uh, this is a picture I found trolling on the internet. There's a really good video uh, uh, 
on the internet that was done by, um, you guys know who, um, what's his uh, K7 OG? Uh, Dave Cass. Dave I love his videos. Anyhow, he goes and visits a ham shack down in Arizona. And they do a whole video on what that guy did for grounding. And it's really a great video. I'd suggest you watch it. This is a case where a guy put a lot of money into his grounding solution. A lot of money. But it's grounding done to the nines. So, but anyhow, I thought this was a really nice, uh, see, you'll notice he's got his rotator is grounded. All of his coax are grounded and they're marked and they're in this really nice case and they've got a metal sheet that everything's connected to and I thought, there's the goal to strive for. This is the goal. Now on some of them I've seen them use a copper sheet. Okay, so here's another example from Mount Ogden. This is another one of my pictures. Um, this was taken from the saddle, uh, courtesy of Scott and his and the Weaver County Sheriff's four-wheel drive. I love going up there, it's so pretty up there. But anyhow, uh, here is the entrance point for all the coax that comes into the Mount Ogden site. And you'll see they've got, I mean, look at this ground, this, this ground cable. God, it's gotta be a half inch in diameter. And, um, and then if you look, if you go inside and you look at the other side of this panel, there are lightning arresters on every bit of coax that comes into that building. So this, I think, is an example of, uh, of really doing it right. But remember, this is Mount Ogden. A lightning strike is not a maybe, it's a when. And so, and they seem to weather it just fine. And I think part of the reason they do is because they've really paid attention to the grounding in that, in that building. Okay, now we have a good ground system outside. What do we do inside? So we've got our ground rod or rods in place. We've bonded them together. We've connected it to the uh, common point ground on our service panel. Uh, so now we go inside the shack. And here's that common bus bar that we were talking about earlier, right here, and all the equipment is connected to this common bus bar. So again, reoccurring theme, connect to a common bus bar. Don't daisy chain. Now I've seen some videos where they run everything back to the antenna tuner and then run the antenna tuner out to the ground. Electrically, that looks like a bus bar. You're just using the antenna tuner as your bus bar and that's fine. I think it's a little inconvenient, and uh, but you can do it that way. I mean, I don't know that one is any better than the other, but the main point is don't daisy chain. And all of these wires that are connecting here use a, a number 12 or a number 14 wire. It can be solid copper. It can be stranded wire. Uh, one of the key takeaways you'll see in a minute is you want to make sure lightning doesn't go through your shack. Because if lightning goes through your shack, that wire ain't going to be big enough. But it won't matter because your equipment will be melted down anyhow. So, um, and we'll talk about that other concept in a minute. But this is a good way to do it. Now on my station, this lug right here that you see, my common bus bar is connected to that lug right there. So if you were to go on the inside and look at the window inside, you would see that my, there's a wire that runs from my bus bar that runs along the back of my desk to that lug right there. And then that lug is connected to ground rods and to my service ground on my electrical panel. So here again, everything is bonded together. So, and then this is a picture of the underside of my electrical panel, and I know it's really hard to see, but this white and black wire, these go to grounding rods that are connected to my tower. This is the white wire that comes from my shack. So here again, all of the grounds in my entire house all terminate there. All of them. The ones in the house that were wired into my house, the ones in my shack, the ground rods, everything connects ultimately to here. So. 
Key takeaway regarding lightning protection, you do not want lightning going through your shack on its way to ground. So when you're defining your ground system on your shack, think about the path that that lightning is going to take when it strikes your antenna. You don't want it going into your shack. Okay, that's really the most important thing. So here's a picture of it done right where lightning hits the power line in this case. It never comes into the shack. It hits the ground rod outside the house and goes into the bonded ground rods surrounding the house. And in the previous picture, you'll see that the lightning actually takes a route right through his house because those two bottom ground rods right here they were not bonded together. Okay, Had he bonded those two ground rods together, that lightning would not need to pass through his shack. So that's the key difference there. Now, one other thing that I want to bring up, um, and that is the length of that ground wire. Now, I'm fortunate in that my shack is located literally right next to my service panel. So the wire that runs from my shack to the service panel is maybe three feet long, maybe. Uh, now the runs to the ground rods will vary in length. They're probably the longest is probably about, I'm going to say about eight feet. The shortest is probably about four feet. The point I want to make is do whatever you can do to keep that ground rod as, or that length of wire that runs to your ground rod as short as you possibly can. Uh, I, and I'll give you a real world example that I dealt with. Guy has a patio and his ham shack sits just inside the window overlooking his patio. So the choice was, do I run a wire along the brick out to the ground rod, which is going to make my grounding run on the order of about 20 feet. Or do I drill a hole through the patio right below the window where my ham shack is and drive the ground rod there? Big, big hassle. I get it. You got to get a drill, drill a hole in your patio. I get it. But the right thing to do would be to drill a hole in your patio, sink that ground rod in, and connect your ground to that ground rod. That would keep that whole length of wire short. Now, why do you ask? What, why do we need to keep it short? Well, part of the reason, but not the entire reason, is you want to avoid lengths that are going to be a quarter wave on whatever bands you use. So how long is a quarter wave uh, on 10 meters? About eight feet. So keep that in mind. Uh, this will come up again when we talk about common mode current. So um, anyhow, so those are now again, you know, there are some things we have control over and some things we don't. And the property manager may not want us drilling holes in the patio. <laughs> OK. We do the best we can. We run that wire. We make sure it's a nice big heavy gauge wire. Run it out to that ground rod. Maybe put another ground rod in and bond them together and call that good. And that's fine. So, but if you want to do it according to the book, you drill a hole, pound the ground rod in, and connect to that. Okay, so we'll replay that. Okay. How likely is your house to be hit with lightning? That's not my picture. <laughs> I'm sure that we all ask ourselves that. Living here in Utah, uh, you know, some of us may be more prone to lightning strikes than others. I think people that live out in the flat area, out in Hooper and Plain City and, you know, out there kind of not too far from the lake, um, may be in a position where they're going to get struck more than maybe someone that lives in inner city Ogden. Um, I don't know up in the valley. I don't know what that's like. Uh, certainly if I had a mountaintop house outside a snow basin or somewhere, uh, definitely, you know, 
So, but here's, here's a map that shows you just how likely a thunderstorm is in terms of days per year. And we're in a zone where it runs between 18 and 36 thunderstorm days a year. So that's fairly low. Now, if you lived over here in places like Florida and down here, that's a whole different discussion. And you would want to take lightning protection very seriously. In risk management terms, lightning strike is a low probability in our area, but has a high impact if the risk is realized. So is it worth it to not prepare? That's up to you. So I want you to look at this slide for a minute and I want you to think about it and ask yourself, have I done my due diligence in putting a proper grounding system in my house? Do I want to not be the guy calling the fire department because my house got hit by lightning? So that's something you need to wrestle with in your own head. I did not take that picture. <laughs> Okay, this is an eye chart. Don't bother reading it now. Download the slides and read it. This talks a lot about the difference between uh, AC safety versus a lightning protection ground. Something I referred to earlier. This really kind of goes in and says, this is where they're different. This is where they overlap. But the general takeaway from this slide is they overlap considerably. So, okay, now let's talk about grounding. Grounding is all about controlling and minimizing the effects of RF energy um, in your shack and in your house. In many of the articles I've wrote, and if you've read any of my articles, you'll see that I almost always refer to common mode currents, okay? Almost always. Um, they're kind of strange. And I, I've labeled it the poltergeist effect. TV mysteriously turns on. The sound mysteriously just comes up. Your washing machine loses its mind. Doorbell, uh, rings. doorbell rings. I mean, there's all kinds of unexplained things that happen. Go ahead, Dave. Those, those little R, the touch lamps? Yeah. Uh, the one that I had in my bedroom, whenever I was on digital modes, it would just go through its cycle. Blink, 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 blink. So it goes low, medium, high, off, low, medium, high, off. And it just keep doing that as long as I'm transmitting. And then, so my wife is in the bedroom. And she's like, what the heck is going on? And it was just that one. We had two of them in the bedroom, but just that one had this problem. I think we've all had experienced examples of, of that. I know in my case, uh, my TV upstairs would just all of a sudden come on and the volume would go to the max, <laughs> you know, every time. And, and so anyhow, and I know Neil related something to me about his wife's washing machine. Yeah. Um, you know, the extreme example is when you hit the push to talk and you get an RF burn. That's, that's kind of the extreme example. But if you've got a lot of weird things that goes on when you're on 20 meters talking to England, you know, and your wife's complaining that her sewing machine just mysteriously started running, you know, that may be the reason. So, and you see here, uh, so let's talk about why that happens. I love this slide. I love this slide because this slide says it all better than I could. Every bit of wire in your shack is, an is part of your antenna. Every bit of it is part of your antenna, okay? So, and every bit of the wire in your house can also be a part of your antenna. Now, that's not good because, well, number one, when you hit the transmit key, that antenna may be transmitting to things that you don't want it to transmit to. And when you're listening, you may be hearing things that you'd rather not hear, like the RF coming off the LED lights in your kitchen. Just a couple of examples. So, and the RF in your shack can be coming from two places. It can be coming directly off the antenna or it could be coming from and or it could be coming from common mode current which is that current that runs down the outside of your coaxial cable 
So what do we do about that? Well, here, here I talk again about um, RF coming uh, in here, and I'll give you, uh, uh, and I'll give you a perfect example. So uh, I have this uh, two-element quad that sits, uh, and before that I had a different antenna, but I have this two-element quad that's on a tower um, just outside my house. Well, it just happens to be on the other side of the wall where my TV is uh, upstairs. And I mentioned earlier that every time I transmit, my TV would come on. Transmit with 100 watts or more. My TV would come on. Well, what it turned out to be was I've got this piece of uh, RG59 TV cable that runs through my attic, down through the wall, and into my TV. Well, what was happening is the antenna, that piece of coax, was picking up the RF coming off my antenna. And the way I solved it ultimately is I put a set of RF jokes on that line and the problem went away. So now I can transmit with 300 watts and it doesn't bother my TV. Uh, but it was old RG59, you know, it's, and it's going to pick up crap, you know. Go ahead, question? So, Gene, I heard you a couple of times mentioning watts, you know, going from 100 watts to 300 watts. So how important is, uh, you know, I mean, some of these things might not be addressed. Uh, the poltergeist effect might not happen with 100 watts, but then you fly a uh, amplifier, and then all of a sudden you start getting the poltergeist effect. So how much does that really matter between the wattage? Well, it you know, it really depends. If it's RF coming in through your antenna, it's all about, um, the proximity of those wires to that antenna uh, or the amount of energy coming off the antenna. So either of those, I mean, you put the wire right up by the antenna and 10 watts will trip, you know, will cause the TV to funk out, you know. Um, you move it further away and now maybe you need 200 watts to get the TV to, but it's, you know, it's indicative of the same problem. You got RF coming in where you don't want it. Um, for you know whatever reasons you know and it could be common mode current it could be the antenna it could be both this is why I'm kind of and I sorry to sound like a broken record I'm not a big fan of an attic based antenna now I get it some of us that's our only option trust me I feel your pain it's it's our only option but if there's any way you could get an antenna outside of your house I would give that some hard thought Otherwise, you're going to have to try to just figure out how to live with that antenna in your attic. RF chokes, balance, being cognizant of how you're routing that, that antenna, you know, stuff like that. It's just something that comes with attic-based antennas. Antennas that run across your top of your house, same thing. You might have, you might have to deal with the same problem. So it's just the way it is, you know. So, um, okay, so RF coming from your antenna can happen when a conductor in your shack is exposed to a high amount of RF. This can be due to being too close to the antenna or running high power or both. So, I'll move on. Common mode current happens when a balanced antenna such as a dipole, and dipole is a whole family of antennas like G5RVs are a dipole, of course, you've got your regular dipole. Even Yagi antennas have a dipole antenna built into the driven element. That's, that's what it is. It's a dipole. Um, what causes that imbalance? Metallic objects in the near field of the antenna. So if you've got a set of, you've got, let's say, your swamp cooler uh, sits above the right side of your attic-based vertical and or attic-based horizontal antenna, that going to affect the balance. Uh, let's say you've got a vent that runs underneath the left side of your antenna, that's going to throw it out of balance. There's a million things that will throw a balanced antenna out of balance. Uh, the other thing that can happen is the legs of the antenna are different lengths. Now in an off-center fed antenna, that's just how they are. Um, and that's why, and we'll get to the next part of this uh, discussion, and in the case of vertical antennas, 
The vertical uses the coax shield of a part of its ground plane, and this is going to be true in virtually every vertical installation. It wants to use the shield of the coax as a part of its ground plane. So, what do we do? Oh, certain kinds of antennas, such as in-fed wire antennas, they have common mode current out the yang-yang. I mean, Alan's antenna, I don't know that he knows this, but any in-fed wire antenna is looking for the other half of the antenna, and it ain't there. So what does it do? It sends all that RF down the coax cable, down the outside of the shield. Twin lead that has not been properly routed. Boy, I see this all the time as I go to visit people's houses. Uh, Justin, I'll pick on him. He got a piece of twin lead that runs over rain gutters and down through a window, and it's like, Justin! So, and, and I, there was another house that I visited uh, out in Washington Terrace. Same thing. And then, to make matters worse, he had the extra length of the coax, or the twin lead, because like, for example, the G5 RV, they're very specific about how long that length of twin lead should be. So they coil the rest of it up. Not a good idea. So uh, anyhow, so just be aware, if you use twin lead, you need to be aware of how you're routing that twin lead. And that's another reason why twin lead through your attic is probably not a good idea. Try to prevent common mode current from happening in the first place. So make sure the legs of your antenna are about the same length. I mean, if they're different by an inch or two for 40 meters, it's not going to matter that much. Now, if it's 10 meters, you probably need to get them a little closer. But for a 40 or 80 meter, whatever, dipole, 20 meter, if they're an inch or so within the same length, it's probably not a big deal. Use RF chokes and choking balance and unins at the antenna feed point. I stress this hugely. Every antenna, every antenna should have either a balin or an unin, and depending on the kind of balin you use, may also need to have, or unin, may also need to have a choke, okay? They're not expensive, they're easy to build, and they will make all the difference in the world. So, uh, I just heard the other day of someone who put a ballon on an antenna and his signal reception went way better than it had been. The noise went down. So that's another thing about using a choke is it can help eliminate noise. I know on Alan's uh, long wire, we put a choke underneath his unin and it dropped the noise level, I think, uh, two S units on 40 and 80 meters. What is a unit? I've never heard of that. Um, okay, so a ballon is, is unbalanced to balanced. That's a ballon. Unbalanced to balanced. An unin is unbalanced to unbalanced. So an in-fed wire, you got coax cable, which is unbalanced wire, if you will and an in-fed wire, which is an unbalanced antenna. So it's unbalanced to unbalanced, okay? So, and the internet is rife with documentation on how to build these things. And if you need some help, call me, I'll help you. Question clear in the back. An important point to make when you're talking about balanced and unbalanced, some may not know we're talking about the impedance of the feed lines. Thank you, yes. What we're talking about is the impedance of the feed line. So, for example, on a one-to-one -one ballon, it's assumed that there's not going to be any impedance transformation. So, 50 ohm coax to an antenna that has basically a 50 ohm feed point, okay? Where we use a, like a four-to-one ballon or a two-to-one ballon in the case of uh, my quad antenna, I'm going from a 50 ohm unbalanced to a 100 ohm balanced loop. So I use a two to one ballon. And then there's, we can go deeper into that, but then there's uh, choking balance and non-choking balance. Now, in the case of an unin, we go from, it's, I use a nine to one unin, unbalanced to unbalanced. So I use a 
50 ohm coax, but I transform that 50 ohm impedance into 250 ohms through that 9 to 1. And then some of you have heard like a 49 to 1 ballon where we go from, or Unin, we go from 50 ohms to almost 2,500 ohms. This is what we use in a half wave wire antenna. So that's kind of, so that's what we're really talking about is the feed point impedance of the antenna being transformed in some way to more closely match the 50 ohm feed point or the 50 ohm um, in our coax. Go ahead. So I keep on hearing you talk about balance, but you didn't exactly explain the material that's used. So what kind of ferrite material do you suggest? Is it like a mix 42, a mix 31? Uh, there's, so, there's so many different ferrite materials. Soft core, then there's uh, iron core. So good question be a better discussion for a ballon? It, it is a much longer discussion, but I'll answer it very briefly. Yeah. For making chokes, you want to use a 31. When you're making chokes, use a 31. Okay. If you're making a ballon or an unin, then there's other, and you do not want to use powdered iron core. You want to use ferrite. And you can get those off of Amazon, although make sure that what you buy you know what mix it is. A lot of stuff out there they don't say. So you don't know what you're getting. But use a 31 um, for choking. Uh, so if you're going to make ferrite uh, chokes for your power cables and stuff, which we'll get into in a moment, uh, use a 31 or 31 beads. Go ahead. Well, so there's a balance part. Uh, when you look up that choke uh, or, or that uh, core, you can, you can, most of them will tell you what the frequency yes. of operation is for that. Yes. So that you make sure that you buy the one that has the more, it will properly uh, process the signal that you're going to get through. Yes. And in fact, in my book, and this is in one of my articles, I actually, it's actually here where it shows you what frequencies and how many wraps and turns and that's a deeper discussion for another time, but yes, you're right. You had a question? Yeah, so for putting the, the ballon close to the antenna feed point, does that mean so like right at the base of the antenna or as close to it, that's where you want to put that? Yeah, right where those two wires come together, that's where I would put the ballon or the una. Where you go, where you transition from coax to antenna, that's where you put the ballon and una. Now, on uh, on the vertical antenna for the club, for example, I've experimented with putting the choke out about 30 feet away from the base of the antenna in the feed line, thinking, why not use the coax shield for part of my radial system? What's the harm in that? As long as I choke it off, at some point, so it doesn't go all the way back to the, the station. So, but otherwise I always put that at the feed point. If I've got a situation where I need to use a, a ballon and a choke together, the choke goes just below the ballon. You know, I make a little short piece of coax and they're six to eight inches apart. So, okay, move on. Uh, how do we control? Use ferret rings or beads. Palomar Engineering is a great place to buy quality products. I bought a lot of their ferrite beads and they make, they make good stuff. Can you buy them cheaper? Absolutely, go on Amazon. Problem is you don't always know what you're getting. So just be aware of that. Go ahead. There's also a guy in Salt Lake City, KF7P Metalworks, that sells uh, supplies for Okay. So you can find them out there, but like I said, I like, I like Palomar. Um, Balin Design sells them. Um, and there are several places that, that sell them, but I bought, I've either bought them from Amazon or I get them from Palomar. Go ahead. Places like uh, Palomar, too, they make kits for your radio as well. Yeah, they do. They make whole... You say, I've got this radio, what do I need? And they'll give it to you. Yep. If you're using a ground-mounted antenna, lay out a proper radio field. Well, uh, so... Here we say use ferret rings and beads on USB cables, monitor cables, mouse cables, Ethernet, audio cable, elect, 
any piece of cable in your shack, if you're troubled by RF in your shack, protect it with ferrite. Ferrite beads, ferrite chokes, whatever. Keep ground wires that run from your equipment to your station ground as short as possible. Uh, if you're using a ground mounted antenna, lay out a proper radio field and use a choke on the feed line at the feed point of the antenna. A ground rod is of little value to a vertical antenna. All a ground rod does for a vertical is protect it from lightning. That's it. If you only have a ground rod and you transmit and then you take that ground rod away, you will not see any difference in the performance of the antenna. None. Lay down two radials and you'll start to see a difference. Lay down four and it'll just get progressively better and better until you get to about, well, technically they say 60, but diminishing point of returns is around 30 radials there, give or take. But if you want to put in more, God, knock yourself out. Um, okay, believe it or not, that's almost the last slide. Uh, here's some um, extra research material. Uh, this book is recommended, great book. A lot of what was in this presentation came out of that book. Uh, the uh, National Electric Code uh, 810, uh, there's a PowerPoint where he goes through the 810 and applies it to ham radio stations. The 810 was written for electricians, not for common people like us. Uh, and so this PowerPoint will help to um, kind of demystify. Contact your city regarding local building and electrical codes, especially if you're building an, a tower, okay? They have some fairly specific guidelines. Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to Kent's question on what is an UNAN. And it seems to me that chokes, UNANs, and balans are often used interchangeably in literature. Then that's, that there, it's that's, done incorrectly. That's where I think some of the confusion is. Is, is the terms are used interchangeably. That's, that's all I'm trying to point out. And there's a really easy way to tell them apart. Usually a Ballon and an Unin will have uh, SO239, and then it'll have some sort of a lug or lugs to connect an antenna to. That's going to be either an Unin or a Ballon. A choke will usually have a SO239 in the bottom and an SO239 in the top and it meant to plug into your your feed line. A choke's um, job is to suppress common mode current. A balance job is to provide impedance transformation. In other words, trying to get the that feed point impedance a little closer to what your coaxial cable expects, which will then possibly put your antenna in range of your antenna tuner. But without that ballon or unin, that antenna may be outside of the range of your antenna tuner in order to tune. So uh, go ahead, Neil. Does an un, un, unin do better choking than a ballon? An unin doesn't do any choking. It doesn't. It doesn't. So you almost always, you, I won't say almost, you always need to choke under the UNIN. Now, when you buy an UNIN, one of the questions to ask um, is, does it provide choking? And I've never, and I've talked to Palomar and Ballon Designs about their chokes. None of their products provide choking, their UNINs. Ballons are a different subject. A lot of times the ballon will provide not only the impedance transformation, but also the choking necessary. So, and, and here again, it depends on, you know, like the, uh, there's, I'm getting way off into the, the discussion. What's that? I thought it was the other way around between the ballon no, the Unin, I, like I said, I've never, in all of my discussions with Palomar and the one discussion I had with Ballon Designs, their Unins do not provide choking. But a lot of their Ballons do. What about your Unins? My Unins do not provide any choking and I always recommend a choke be used with the Unin. Larry, before I go to you, I think, uh, I, I think Alan had a question. Have any guys talking to him about grounding? 
what's this daisy chain and don't understand daisy chain? Series versus parallel. Yeah, it's yeah, it's where a wire just goes from one piece of equipment to another piece of equipment to another piece of equipment and then to ground. Where the way it should be is piece of equipment to ground, piece of equipment to ground, piece of equipment to ground, ground to ground. So that's that's the difference. So Larry, you had a comment. I was just gonna mention that I bought a uh, antenna, long wire antenna kit from Palomar, and in the kit was both an un and a choke. That's, that's how they design their yeah, and that's why I like doing business with, with Palomar and Ballon Designs is they understand the, the, the technology and they do, they do a really good job, I think. And they've got a ton of really good information on both their sites. So, um, but yeah, they, like I say, their products are going to be a little more money, but they're good products. So, and I hate to sound like I'm advertising for them. I don't get any money or any consideration from <laughs> maybe, maybe any of them should. guys. I have to pay the same as you if I want to buy a ballon or a choke from them. Go ahead. Did you just make a comment about the purpose of matching impedance and maximum power transfer? Oh, now you're getting into my <laughs> SWR article. Uh, so, um, so what he's referring to is this kind of common fallacy uh, regarding SWR that reflected power is lost energy. So if you've got an antenna with a 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 mismatch, um, in other words, the feed point impedance is um, different than what your 50 ohm coax is, that that reflected energy just evaporates into nowhere. Uh, and that's not what happens. What happens is in most of today's solid state rigs, there's a circuit in there that senses not the SWR, but the impedance mismatch. Now, I guess you could argue, well, that's kind of saying the same thing. I don't know that it necessarily is. So what this circuit does is it throttles back the output power from the radio so that the, the, the power or the current that's going on inside the radio remains within the tolerances of the components they use in the final stages of the amplifier, okay? So you will see a reduction in power if you put a power meter uh, beyond, well, if you put a power meter in, and your rig says it's transmitting with 100 watts, but you're only seeing 80 watts. Well, it could be there's enough of a mismatch in there that the fold-back circuits have kicked in. So the reason we use an antenna tuner, whether it's inside the radio or one external to the radio, is to make sure that the transmitter sees a 50-ohm load, irregardless of what the antenna is. We want the transmitter to see a 50-ohm load. So what that means is if I've got the power set to 100 watts, it's going to send 100 watts into the antenna tuner, and the antenna tuner in turn is going to put 100 watts on that transmission line. Now what happens at the antenna is the antenna will get that, and if there's a mismatch, it'll reflect part of that power back down the wire and radiate all the rest. Well, if there's an antenna tuner in place, that power travels back down the coax, pays a tax along the way called attenuation, which basically turns part of that RF into heat. Not a lot, a little bit. It's based on the properties of that antenna. So, um, so and it hits the, the matching device, your transmatch, your ATU, and what does the ATU do? It turns right around, sends power right back up toward the antenna. So that 10 watts that got reflected hits the ATU minus the little bit that was lost in making that travel down the, the coax. The ATU turns right around and sends what's left right back to the antenna. Well, again, there's a small tax paid as that radio wave travels down the, trans down the coax to the antenna. And now that uh, nine watts is, or let's say that it, 10 watts went back 
uh, a watt was lost, so now nine watts goes back to the antenna. Um, 90% of that power is radiated. 1% is sent back to the ATU, pays tax along the way. And then the ATU turns around, sends that one watt back to the antenna and it pays another tax. And then it's radiated. So the point being is that this idea that if I've got this big mismatch, all this power is lost is a myth. And if you look at the math, or use any of the programs that, that will tell you how much is lost, oh, or that table that I put in my article, you'll see that the amount of loss is, generally speaking, unless it's really high lossy cable, a really long cable run, or a really high frequency, that loss is generally gonna be pretty minuscule. And I, in my article, I kind of put that in context, because uh, the antenna we look at in there, or the loss we look at in there, comes out to be like 0.78 dB. And I remind everybody that it takes 6 dB to move the S meter one unit. So 0.78 dB, is that really something to be concerned about? Now UHF, yeah, maybe it is. But 40 meters, probably not much to worry about. Even at 10 meters, it may not be much to worry about. So. Uh, so if you want, I'm going to single Todd out because I like to make fun of him about this. We put up that antenna at Todd's house and the SWR, uh, I don't remember which year. What's that? It's 10 meters. 10 meters was, I think it was two to one or something. And Todd wanted to just get that just right down. And I bless Todd for that. Um, and I think it was also part of a, and, I, and I've been there, Todd. Trust me, I've done what you've done where you just, you just want to get that SWR down a little bit, a little better, you know, down to at least under 1.5 to 1. If you do the math and you look at the difference it made, you probably would have been better off to go spend time with your property manager. <laughs> so, anyhow, so did I, did I cover that? Did, that was the very long answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. continuous flow through, so you got maximum power transfer from the transmitter to the antenna. Right. The maximum transfer. You want all the watts your your rig is capable of putting that that RF into the antenna. So So that would be the case, especially on a long run of coax, say you're two hundred feet from the actual rig all the way to the antenna for putting an auto tuner at the antenna so that you don't have that cable loss back and forth Ex as, as you're exactly. turning that signal around. Exactly, and what, what Bill's saying is that by putting an antenna tuner, and I'll use a vertical, because that's where we class, we will typically see this, is we'll put an antenna tuner at the base of a vertical. So between the, the radio and the antenna tuner at the base of the antenna, there's no loss because, well, there's going to be the loss for that one trip down the coax. So you can't get away from that. So there'll be that one trip loss. It hits the ATU and the ATU has already matched the antenna. So all of that power doesn't make a trip back down the cable. It goes into the antenna where it's radiated. And you know what? It doesn't matter how long the antenna is. Now, antenna length is a is will affect antenna efficiency so a shorter antenna is probably not going to do as well as a longer antenna so you still have that but at least all the power that's been sent down the coax got into the antenna that's the key takeaway so this is another reason why we use impedance transformers balance unins at the feed point of the impede of the antenna because we want to minimize the mismatch between the feed point of the antenna and the ATU. We, we want to keep that loss as low as possible because the more loss we have, the, the, or the greater the SWR is, the more loss we'll have because we got more power. So 10% of 10 watts is a lot different than 10% of one watt. So we want to keep that, the, the, uh, the mismatch as minimal as we can.
So we transformed that 250 ohms of that long wire down to around 60 ohms uh, where it connects to the, to the coax and then send, and, and so the transmatch it only has to deal with that slight mismatch instead of this huge mismatch. Imagine the mismatch we'd have if we were looking at a half wave antenna where they're 2,500 ohms at the feed point versus uh, and connected directly to a 50 ohm coax. Huge loss. So the other thing that affects loss in transmission line, of course, is the frequency, which infers that it's also affected by the length of the transmission line. So. You're get, you know, now on 160 meters, 200 feet of coax, pfft, there's no loss there. 200 feet of coax at 450 megahertz, whole other discussion. And that's why up on a lot of the repeater sites, uh, we use Heliax, um, where the losses are really, and if you got just all kinds of money to spend, then you'll use LMR 600. So I, I looked at half-inch Heliax compared to LMR 600, and the LMR 600 was actually a little bit lower in loss. Of course, you could always go to 7 8 Heliax, and um, so if you got a really long run. Now, Mount Ogden, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've got about, our worst case scenario is about 90 feet. So to a 400, and we're using that, um, I think it's the Ultraflex. And I calculated the loss, it was dB and a half roughly. So anyhow, okay, I'm way over time, but if you guys wanna keep asking questions, it's okay. Otherwise, I will thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. If you've got questions, feel free to get a hold of me. Uh, my email address is on most of my articles. And uh, I always love talking about this stuff. Back to you. Thank you.